Hi, everybody. It's Susan Clinton, one of your hosts for Tough to Treat, along with my lovely co-host, Erica Mello. Welcome, Erica. Welcome, Susan. How are you? Good, good. This is episode number 200, everybody. Very excited that we made it to 200. Mm -hmm. And we're looking forward to continuing. This episode is going to be talking a a little bit about something that we discussed at our CSM course just not too long ago in Boston. I want everyone to be on the lookout. Erica and I are going to actually put this course together and release it um, this summer. So you want to keep your eye out for it. We both have some obligations this spring, but we're going to be getting this together along with some other exciting things this summer. So um, keep your eyes out for it. And the best way to do that is to email us at toughtotreatpt at gmail.com. And also remember to go to our website, www.toughtotreat.com and look for our, look for our, you know, um, our old posts there. There's a search engine to help you find things. Yeah, that you may want to listen to. Also, it's just really important to join our email list so that you can get our most up to date information that we'll be having coming out this year. Since it's exciting, uh, two hundred episode, we're mm-hmm. going to look forward to more reviews and doing some yeah. contests for that. Yeah, yeah. Release of our course and some other exciting adventures. So get on our email list. Don't don't miss out on this. Yeah. And we have some good, really good clinical PDFs on there as well that you and I both wrote. So if you're new Mm -hmm. to the podcast, uh, welcome. Uh, But our website has a lot, a lot on there. And uh, I listened to the episode, Susan, I actually re-listened to a lot of them myself. Mm -hmm. And I just type in the search engine, knee pain or or whatever, because I think that we both learned from it. And for those of you who Mm -hmm. haven't, I would urge you to do that, even if it's just listening to 10 minutes of something that you missed. So uh, happy 200. (laughs) Yeah, 100%. And don't forget, we are also able to be downloaded on YouTube as far yes. as, you know, so if you want to just have a quick place, an easy place to listen or to go back, um, we're on YouTube as well. So, yeah. all right. Yeah. Enjoy the episode, everybody. Thank you. Hi, everybody. It's Susan Clinton, one of your hosts for Tough to Treat. And I'm here with Erica Mello, my uh, co-host. Hi, Erica. Hi, welcome, Susan. <laughs> welcome to episode number 200. Mm-hmm. Today, we're going to dive into um, something that I that we spoke about when we did our lecture at CSM uh, uh, just a week or so ago. Yeah, um, time flies. And I, we get the most questions about finding drivers. And one of the things that we discussed at CSM was thinking a little bit more outside of the box. Um, We always are talking about the foot, the thorax, the pelvis, the neck. Um, But I want to talk a little bit about um, the vestibular system, the vestibular ocular system, Mm -hmm. including the upper cervical, not so much as those individual things, but the balance system as a driver. Yeah. And so I'm just going to set it up and then we can talk about various things that, you know, you and I have run into with Mm -hmm. this. Um, A lot of people are always talking to me about why I am treating the balance system when I'm treating people with pelvic health problems. And Mm. the reason that I do that is because there's, we know that there's real musculoskeletal issues that go along with pelvic health problems. But we also know that people, when, and this is going to be true for just about anybody, whether they have pelvic health or not, whenever people adapt, their whole system has to adapt. So if we have five ankle sprains on one side, on the right side, and we've totally shifted off to the left, it, mm-hmm. our whole entire system is going to adapt to that. Yep. Standing on the left side with the left shift of the center of mass past you know, the line of gravity Um, all the way over is going to become our new midline. Mm -hmm. That's where we live. And we can work with people to get back onto the right foot, to teach them right foot exercises, to shift back over. But if we don't do some other stuff to help the balance system make the change and make the shift, they're going to stay on the left side, no matter what we do. And this is one of the reasons we see people over and over and over again that have been to many different places and have gotten excellent treatment, but they're not never looking beyond the region of the body that is in trouble. In other yeah. words, where they're having pain. Yeah. 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 So, 
So, you know, like somebody could come in with left hip pain and be this person and they're just looking at treating the left hip and they're not really looking at, wow, maybe we should like help them gain some mobility back in their ankle or stability in their right ankle and be able to, now we can work with their vestibular ocular cervical reflex system and help them begin to make the shift back over to midline yeah. so that they're not being pulled over. So I think in many ways, when we look at this, um, Erica did a beautiful job at CSM of talking about timelines. And one of the things she talked about was what was the, what really got the person to make the ad adaptation? Yeah. You know, for this particular thing that I'm talking about simply, and we'll get into a couple of other examples here in a minute. But for this one that I'm talking about specifically, the ankle sprains are what caused the shift in this one person, mm -hmm. right? Then they yeah. have the left hip pain. Yeah. And now they're going to adapt some way around that left hip pain, mm -hmm. you know, but what's yeah. key, you know, and so the idea is something got them over there. Now the next thing is what's keeping them there. Yeah. And okay. for this particular scenario, we'd have to almost argue that the balance system is what's keeping them over there. You know, there's that primary thing. The primary problem is that they moved away from this instability or problem right ankle with these multiple ankle sprains. Yeah, they and, normalized it. Yeah, and so they get rehabbed, but their their center of mass has shifted somewhat. And so mm -hmm. they're never on that right foot the same way again. So maybe they lose power, they lose stability, or they lose all these other things. So there's reasons for them to keep shifting, but eventually the balance system is going to adapt to that yeah. and become almost like, you know, if not a primary driver, certainly a secondary driver that is interfering with their ability to regain and re-get themselves back into a much more optimal um, performance posture, just even for walking or whatever it is that they're trying to do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, it's funny, they get rehabbed in a, their dominant pattern and yeah. they become even stronger in that dominant pattern, which is, it's like a vicious cycle, right? And you want to be able to train the new pattern and the way into that system or the way into that, what's the word I'm looking for? The way into that is... Mm -hmm through can absolutely be through balance right and so get, go ahead i just wanted to add those two yeah, no, it, yeah. It, it's true so here's the other situation and i you know balance can be changed um balance can be challenged balance can adapt balance can become optimized uh we can do a lot with the whole balance system i mean there's mm -hmm. you know uh physical therapists that stick with this when that system is really a problematic system you know, such as, you know, um, uh, dizziness and mm -hmm. all the yeah, other yeah. pieces. I'm not really getting into so much of that here, but there's a reason why we want to look at the balance system and challenge that balance system so that we're not just rehabbing an old pattern or a dominant pattern, like you would call it, the, the reason that they started there, but that we're actually kind of helping the person integrate and in, back into their full optimization of their nervous system which yeah. is really what's going to govern the motor control and the motor patterns and the motor performance for them. Yeah. So the, the story that I like to tell that kind of helps people understand this is that we see a lot of people who have had nerve root injuries in their lumbar spine. It happens when they're young. That's generally when those things happen. Yes, it can happen when they're older, but it's, it's usually a different mechanism that happens um, for them when they're older, you know, it's more stenotic. It's, you know, has those mm -hmm. other types of things that go on. Nevertheless, we have somebody who may have had, and this is why the history is so, so, so important. Um, they, if they have had a nerve root injury in their life, like, you know, and it's gone down the leg and it was really bad, whether they had surgery or not, how does the body adapt to that? So when we have something that is that painful, we're going to move away from it. And in the case of a nerve root injury, we have to almost argue that there's an in-plate micro fractures that go on. Mm -hmm. You can't tear the annulus, you know, without without fracturing the in-plate somehow, in -plate. right? Mm -hmm. In the yeah. in between the vertebral bodies. Yeah. So the body does not like fracture. It doesn't like it tractioned and it doesn't like it compressed. Mm -hmm. So it's so people have to move away from what's you know, their brain is going to signal something to happen for them to move away from it. 
And for those of you who didn't listen to this podcast, you can go back and listen to the one called uh, the SOAS Triangle. Yeah. Uh, talks a little bit about the mechanism behind this and all of that. I won't go through it, but that's the one that you want to go back and review. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing about this is what happens is, is we, if you think about, I have a right nerve root injury at L4, L5. So my body is actually, my brain and my body are going to do something. They're going to side bend me away from that. So I can get off of that very painful, irritated nerve root. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you just stand up on your two feet and side bend to the left, what happens to your head? Your head goes to the left too, right? So mm -hmm. you're you know, at the horizon askewed. Yes. And our central nervous system is primarily organized to keep our eyes on the horizon in a level way. That's the, that's our right. It's, a, it's an old primordial, primordial reflex. Mm -hmm. It's a pattern. And we're not going to walk around with our head sideways. We're not no. going to do it. We, everything that's inside of us tells us to get those eyes level on the horizon. So in order for that to happen, we bring our head up, but we're, our body is still side bent. Our head comes back up and we're not going to walk around, you know, with our body side bent and our head up. So we're just going to kind of like the, the upper trunk actually shifts to the left. So that's yeah. where we get that, that shift that you see. Mm -hmm. and a nerve root injury yes, yes we can we have them back out of that we can do that we can help them with the lateral shift but the problem is now the balance system has taken over and is going to hold on to that old pattern because it's the only way that they could keep their head up during the acute phase yes yeah, so, yeah yeah so if we don't do anything to rebalance out the thorax and the upper trunk the head the neck the eyes the vestibular system, yes, we can get people to shift back. Yes, we can get the pain better. Yes, the nerve root will eventually heal. All of those things. But we're going to have this inherent kind of weird muscular control pattern around where the injury was. And we're going to have a balance system issue on top of it. Mm -hmm. So it may not be that the right leg is going to be weak forever because of this nerve root power outage that they had. Mm -hmm. It could be that, that because they've got this now thoracic shift. And, and writing reflex differential going on in their head is what's keeping them from being on their right side and therefore maybe perhaps more prone to injury on the right or the left or whatever, depending upon what they're trying to do. Yeah, yeah. You know, I was just going to say that also, I'm just thinking we have not done an episode on this guy, but he had uh, a former patient of mine. He had, this is just the opposite. He had a nerve root injury on his left side, uh, significant. And- he was, so that's sort of like you think about from our CSM talk, what set him up, what kept him there. You know, the, the nerve root injury was the nerve root injury and he suffered that because for whatever reason, um, but he was a, a rower and he was left sweep in the boat. So he got stuck on his left side. So it's almost the, the other thing. So when you see somebody who has an injury to one side and they're still loading that side, mm -hmm. you know, what kept him there? So you're like, you, you, the body will absolutely compensate like like susan was mentioning but when you see that 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 non-habitual i'm going to offload my left side because i have a nerve root injury and you don't and they're still loading that side that should raise your radar and go down a more deeper clinical reasoning process so what's keeping them there right mm -hmm. the, yeah right there. and for instance you know one-sided sports keep pe keeps yes. people in a, in a dominant pattern yes, it does. and the balance system resets around that. Yeah. So it may be that maybe he wants to get off of that right side, mm. but the balance system is keeping him there. Yeah. You know, so because everything reorganizes around the balance system to keep us upright and to keep our eyes on the horizon. Yeah. That's the way that we can survive in this world because then our eyes can move around and can scan the environment and we can be these anticipatory beings. The problem is when we start having all of these shifts and changes is we lose the, um, I'm just going to call it variability um, of our, of our eyes to do all the shifting and moving that it needs to do. Mm -hmm. And that in turn sets the vestibular system to even have a different gain. Mm -hmm. So the, if the eyes aren't moving, the vestibular system isn't moving as much either. Yeah, and, and when the vestibular system doesn't move as much, it doesn't have all of the variability of motions that we can tolerate. 
it, you know, I was just going to say, I'm thinking because like I'm at my, looking into my screen right now, I have no need to move my eyes, right? At all. Right. I'm staring. And this is where we, we function. But because Susan and I are such big hockey fans, you think about a hockey goalie, he trains that vision, right? I mean, in, in, in back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. I mean, I'm like, you know, into hockey right now. So, um, but back and forth, but you think about the, the drills that those guys have to do, it, it, just just agility and balance drills. Anyway, I'll let you go, but I just had to yeah, mention no, that as well. I think it's making me remember a, a wonderful um, commercial. Um, Eric is in New York and I'm in Pittsburgh. I, I'm always going to be a Pittsburgh Penguin fan. <laughs> I'm in Michigan now, but I'm still a Penguins fan. But anyway, Mark Andre Fleury, who was one of our favorite goalies in Pittsburgh and now is with the Minnesota Wild, mm. um, when his daughter was born, he was in um, Pennsylvania. And of course, they did commercials with him, like they do with you know all of the you know bigger, more you know charismatic mm. players on the team. But his whole thing was he had the puck. She was in one of those little bouncy swings. Mm -hmm. You know, as a as a very young child, like maybe seven or eight months old, and he's there with the puck, telling her, "What's the puck? What's the puck? What's the puck? What's the puck? What's the puck? <laughs> that's adorable. Yeah, it is. It's hilarious. But that's exactly you know the yeah. thing is that if there's reason to do it, we'll do it. But if yeah. the reason is taken, you know, sometimes that is taken away from us because of of, of things that happen. Yeah. Um. To us in our life, and so we lose that. We lose that flexibility, that optimal, you know, gain. We lose that um, ability to move up and down and around in the ranges. And um, for a lot of my clients, even they have a hard time when we do eye exercises. They have a hard time. The one they have the hardest time with is looking up. Mm. It's easy to look down. It's easy to look to the sides. But when we add the upper quadrants and the going straight up. Mm -hmm. Their head goes up immediately, yeah. they, you know, so they've lost that. And why? Because as we age, we put on glasses that narrow our reading range down to a certain place and we have to put our eyes down to see through it. Yeah. That's why yeah. they build those glasses that way or else we'd be what, well, you know, when people wear readers, um, oftentimes, you know, they're, they do all these funny things like they'll push, you know, they're, they'll knock their head up to, you know, to read out of their readers mm -hmm. I do or that. they'll drop their head so that they can mm -hmm. look above the readers to see something, mm -hmm. you know, so you'll see people do these things. Yeah. Um, and, and they're, they, you know, the environment is, is what's holding them there. You know, that's mm -hmm. a, that's a visual loss that holds us into those, those things combine that with the musculoskeletal adaptation mm -hmm. yeah. and dominant pattern. We're, we're set up for no wonder we fall. <laughs> that's true. That's very true. Right. No wonder we fall. Even if yeah. nothing else is wrong the rest of your life, no wonder our balance system, you know, begins to change. When we have this balance system involved like this, and one of the things that I'm always screaming about is rotation, 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 is if we don't rotate, there's no reason for our head, eyes, and neck to rotate. And without that, we don't have that great functional flexibility between the upper cervical spine, the vestibular system, and the ocular system. And without that, the proprioceptive system, which sits in our suboccipital sp our space, is not really being utilized to its ultimate. So in other words, 50% of the body's proprioceptors are in the suboccipital space. So it's very yeah. important for us to know where our head is in space, mm -hmm. but it also can also be very limiting when the only input coming into the cerebellum is that the head is being still, the head is being still, the head is being still. So yeah. the motor pattern is going to just say the head is still, we just, this is where we are. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's not, yeah. it doesn't, it's not going to happen. And then when we have to do something kind of complicated, um, it's like, wow, <laughs> I can't yeah. stand on one leg and throw my arm the other way and, and hold on to the door that I'm pushing and uh, fight the elements of the wind at the same time. Yeah. Or, or, or we, yeah. Or even just our reaction times, right? If yeah, we right. catch ourselves or we're falling or we have to grab something, that's when injury happens, right? Yeah. Because if right. we have to grab something, those should be, that should be tr part of the treatment plan, whatever the driver is, right? Yes. Yeah. yes. 100%. So yeah. no matter what the driver is, you've got to reset the balance system around it. Mm -hmm. um, because you want to, what you want to be able to see is after they do these wonderful exercises and they do these reset exercises and they you know 
can tell that, you know, that they're improving and changing is we want to see not only better motor performance, but we want to see, does it really change when they're standing still? Has their center of mass really changed? Yeah. What about standing on one leg? What does that lunge look like? What does the squat look like? Did it really begin to shift and change? Um, and, and if not, why not? And I would tell you nine times out of 10, at least in my world, it's because nothing was ever done to build that reaction time back in and get that system a lot more, um, just a lot more nimble, a lot more nimble. And so when we train balance, it needs to be reactionary. And I think that's the other piece that, that gets missed is that people just, we just forget that, you know, we're anticipatory beings. So we think people just need to be anticipatory of what's going on around them. But we also need to be able to have good reaction times. Like you just spoke about when people get injured is when they are unable to um, master their, their uh, place in the world in, in gravity. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, exactly. You know? <laughs> they're, they're, they're not recruiting optimally. <laughs> not to swing in my finger here, but something's for lack of a better word off. Right. And they just, their neuromuscular system, their nervous system just can't recruit appropriately yet. Mm -hmm. And so they take their path of least resistance or whatever, and, or they're dominant. And then you, you may or may not have an injury, you know, mm -hmm. you may not, but uh, you know, and people, and I, I often hear, oh, we can't do this with older pa patients. I'm like, yes, you can actually, actually you know, geriatric yes, rehab is, is now has tons and tons and tons and tons of things. Yeah. Yeah. Of people standing on one leg, working on a Jenga puzzle or, you know, a Jenga mm -hmm. tower or, you know, reaction times and hitting, you know, the, the board that's lighting up mm -hmm. while they're moving. Yeah. You know, they may be having them walk, you know, walk on a treadmill while they're hitting all of these buttons and doing things. Mm -hmm. um, some of the vestibular rehab is like, as you're walking, turning your head side to side, faster, slower, finding points to like, look at, can you see them all? Can you name them all? Yes. You know, as you go by, can you remember them? When you get through walking down the hallway, what did you see? How many did you see? You know, yeah. it, it, what were the letters? Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, you change the environment. And so I think we talked about this in our CSM talk. You can have them do their their normal routine, but change the environment, have them do challenge the balance system or challenge the vestibular or the, the, uh, the VOR reflex while they're walking. And I like the Jenga. I think that's great because- Ultimately, people, we're not doing just one activity unless right. we're like a professional athlete. We're doing multiple things at once. And I think that's what uh, you were referring to as well. It's how can I multitask while keeping my balance system uh, intact and be able to react, especially here in New York or any big city. If someone shoves you on the street or mm -hmm. honestly, if someone screams loudly, um, which I heard this morning on the subway, I'm like, oh my God, you know, for an older person or someone who has balance issues, that could throw you off. And that's not even a physical issue, right? Right, right, right. So I think those things are important to keep in mind. So simple things people can do, mm -hmm. because we always like to talk about, hey, how can we make this simple and put it in the clinic? Um, you know, first of all, assess it you know, assess the balance. Um, if they're really low level, can they stand on one leg? And for, I would have to say most everybody has some difficulty on one leg more than another. Yeah. Right. It may be yeah. subtle on somebody different, you know, different people. It may be more subtle on somebody who's in better shape or more nimble, even though they've had an injury mm -hmm. versus somebody who's been adapting for a long time. Um, but you know, there's lots of ways to test balance, step up, step down, step downs, you know, like going down the stairs. Do they really need something to hold them? Do they have the eccentric control? Are they looking down? Can they look up? Do, you know, where, what's going side steps? Um, you know, if they're good, can they stand on one leg and bounce up and down? Mm -hmm. You know, can they do a split squat or a kneel down? How do they get on and off the floor? You know, are they able to maintain and use some rotation in any of these activities that they do? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it, when they do stand still, how do they stand? Are they kind of rigid? Are they off to one side? You know, is that dominant pattern still very, you know, very visible to them? Um, you know, very, very strong to them. I'm sorry, very dominant to them, mm -hmm. you know. And again, what got them there? So for some people, it may have been maybe an old ankle injury but they adapted pretty well from it. And then they have a baby and maybe the delivery went fine, but where they carry their baby is what's keeping them there. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Common. Now, yeah. The, now their balance system is changing. Yeah. Yeah. Because of this, and, and I hear this a lot whenever I have people who, you know, who have had children. One of the questions I love to ask is, "When did you stop riding rides?" Or where do you sit in the car? And for the ones with balance issues since their first kid, second kid was born, will always tell me, I drive. <laughs> I yeah, never sit yeah, in the yeah. back seat. Never sit in the back seat. Yeah, I don't yeah. like sitting in the passenger seat. I like to drive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, years ago, I used to, I don't see many older, older patients anymore, but uh, I do have a few just like, who come back to see me and, uh, I used to put weights on their ankles and had them walk with weights just to get that pro set that proprioception and balance. Um, but for those of you who, you know, treat them like more of a younger population or more of an active population, this also still, still, this absolutely still applies. And I think that um, last week I had a guy in here to see me, he had um, his, his complaints, uh, a squash player, and his complaints were, I just feel like my limbs aren't in space. I mean, no joke. That's exactly what he told me. And uh, so for any of you, it, it could be the thorax, that's the driver, the neck, the shoulder, the hand, the wrist, the knee, the foot, the hip, the pelvis, you know? Uh, so what I did with him is because squash, you once again, you know, it doesn't have to be in a sport, but I, you know, the demands of the sport. I put Susan, I put bands around his arms, his forearms, mm -hmm. bands above his knees and bands below his knees. So that challenged his balance and he could right. control it better. So for those of you who are thinking, well, I can't, you know, you want to do single leg balance, just do something else. Like the bands yeah. challenged his system. That ironically, he was better balanced with that than he would then without, because mm -hmm. his brain said, I need to recruit this. I need to do this and this. Mm -hmm. So it, it's not just, it, there's not one right sort of treatment, but, and it, and it doesn't matter what the, where the driver is, you need to, you know, once again, what set him up, what kept them where, but the, his, 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 his narrative was like, I don't feel like my limbs are in the right place. Okay. That's not a typical narrative you would hear from somebody. Right. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and I think that that's important. That brings up another point that I think we should also uh, keep in mind is um, this system will change, but it needs consistent to change. Yeah. And it doesn't need it to be only one thing. So what Erica did was great because it got him to start recruiting differently and to having a different input into his system. I'm sure that she didn't, I'm sure you didn't have him walk around with bands for like the next three months, yeah. but that was something he could do, you know, periodically to put input into his system. Maybe he yeah. liked, Hey, this is a bit better. And that's my feet. I like it when I put this on, that helps me get like set to do my exercise program mm -hmm. or whatever. Yeah, But I, I think that, you know, we have to consider like all of the different ways that the balance can be challenged. And, and the more we throw people into those types of functional activities, when they're ready, the better. So some of the, you know, but again, keep in mind that many of the things that we're talking about today really need to be environmentally reactive. So set the environment up to where they have to do something different. In many podcasts, I've talked about people who use double screens. And they have a side bending, you know, with the opposite rotation kind of tilt to their head. And that feeds into the tri the spinal nucleus of the trigeminal system. And that becomes a dominant pattern in their, in their head and neck. Mm -hmm. And their balance system now is forever changed because of that. And they're doing it in sitting. But it yeah. just gets stuck there. And they're there all the time. So guess what? That consistent input is what changes it for them. And whatever, you know, has been going on, you know, so yeah, they can sit on a cushion, but if they keep doing that with their head, they're going to probably still collapse into something that may be, you know, uh, the source of their, you know, pain, you know, maybe that, you know, if they, if, if, even if we get their chair perfect, if they still do this with their head, they're going to shift in their chair, you know, mm -hmm. but what does it do to them standing up? What does it do to them moving around, how many people really, really, really look at neck and shoulder clients in a standing position? Or they just mm -hmm. go right to the neck and the shoulder and start doing things, which is fine, but what, what are they doing in standing? Yeah, you so know, that, yeah. And sitting and kneeling and all of the other things that they need to move. And I know that you talk a lot about that with your clients as well as like, is the shoulder up? Is it down? Is it, you know, what's the rib cage doing? What's the thorax doing? And does that change if they sit versus stand? 
Absolutely. There may be a secondary driver in there, like from the, you know, the feet the hip or the pelvis yeah. or something else, or the balance system, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, because the balance system may be pulling them off and, and causing their muscles to recruit in a different way. And then they go to the gym to get stronger. And one side starts to break down where the other one doesn't. And it's like, why is that imbalance there? Exactly. And then you realize, okay, well, you know, and, and we talked about this in Boston at the CSM, but if you like, I, all in neck patients, shoulder patients, I, I use this as an example. If you don't, if you put them on the table and have them turn their head and do the, 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 the you know, straight plane movements, you will miss something. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the, you have to look at them in standing, even if, if it's two minutes of a normal, narrow, wide base of support or going on the wall, normal, narrow, wide, you, they will plateau and you won't see how their head responds to gravity mm -hmm. when they load the system in standing or how the ground reaction force goes up through the feet, the hip, the knees, the pelvis into the head. Cause I bet I know myself, I am way worse in standing in my neck than sitting. And why is that? Because I have multiple foot issues. Okay. I have multiple injuries. You need to do your patient a service <laughs> by looking at them and standing. And so like, I'll get off the soapbox, but yeah, you know. yeah, 100%. And I think it's important to think about, um, you know, what do they do in standing? We talk about one legged, you know, stance all the time. Is it just a shift or is there an internal rotation of the leg mm -hmm. as they shift? Is there a rotation of the trunk? What happens when you put the hands on the wall? But still, again, for some of these people, what is their head and neck posture? And is it, how, is it no matter what you do with everything else, is that still stuck there? Mm -hmm. You know, so we have to figure out some ways to do it. And one of the best ways to begin to unlock and increase the nimbleness of that system is to do reactionary types of activities. You can do it with the eyes. You can do it with the head. You can do it with the eyes, head and neck. For sure, um, my favorite app is Clock Yourself, and I just yeah. have them with the imaginary clock on the wall. But I challenge them they when they can do it. First, I have many people who start with just sitting, and that's all they can do. Yeah. Just follow the clock around the wall in the seated position mm -hmm. and get better at it. And then when they're good at it, they can start moving their nose and keeping their eyes still. So mm -hmm. it's head on, you know, eyes on head, head on eyes, you know, head on neck, neck on head, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but I you know, immediately get them up into standing and st then we work on one leg standing. And when that gets better, we start adding the clock into it. So, and maybe I'll have them put the clock on the other wall where they have to stand on one leg and turn their head to look at the clock on the right, mm -hmm. the, clock, look at the clock on the left. So you can, you can get as creative as you want to do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sometimes I'll have people in a corner and I'll say, you've got a clock here and a clock here, you know, kind of at 45 degree angles, you know, so every, not every other number they call out, you're going to find it on the opposite clock. So, the, you know, so they start off slow too. So they look over to the left at the two o'clock mark. And then the next one is six. They may have to look to the right to six o'clock. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, and, and then stand on one leg and do that or stand on, um, one of those uh, foam rollers or foam cushions or yeah 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 or bosu yeah. ball if it's somebody that mm -hmm. is needing to have mm -hmm. that nimbleness back into their activity and for those of you who who may be treating and again athletes are like this but performing artists need this just as badly mm -hmm. you know um i think that's one of the things that really is not done nearly as well in high performance athletes particularly dancers yeah you know, because there's, you know, they really, really, really need that reintegration back in. Mm -hmm. And I remember uh, listening to um, uh, a gentleman who is a physical therapist for a high level basketball team. And one of the things that he noticed with one of the, the athletes, you know, that had this pretty major ankle sprain, ankle injury, it was a big one. But anyway, he, he finally got the guy to start to do um, some of the other exercises that he wanted him, to do, wanted him to do, because what he did was he filmed him. And when he went up to, to do a layup, he noticed that he, you know, he didn't have the right type of diagonal reflex activity that was going on to help him land correctly. Mm, I love it the other and you know he just filmed him and showed it to him and he said 
this is why you're having a problem. This is better, but this is why it's continuing to affect your performance. Yeah. So the guy finally got into it was and allowed him to do a whole bunch of like rotational exercises and reaching and lunge and reach and just, you know, reaching under the leg to the side. I mean, anything that they yeah. could think of mm-hmm. help mm-hmm. him just reintegrate his system as much as possible around rotation and diagonals to help him get that back. It, and, you know, and it, it, it made a huge difference, but no, nobody wants to do that. You know, they just like fix my ankle and I'm back on the field, you know, we're back on the thing. And, 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 and right. And that may be okay for a short period of time, but it's going to be the ones that, that, you know, are, there's going to reoccur, especially in basketball. If you look at basketball, hockey, football, the depth perception of what these guys or women both need to look at whatever speed in tennis is very different. Right. And it's not so much like, you know, sitting and playing on the Wii and doing, but, you know, you need to actually integrate it into a movement patterning, depending on like with this guy with his ankle. I think that was, that's a, that's a great, great, great story. And I, you know, um, I was going to say something earlier um, uh, about a patient of mine who, oh, years uh, during the pandemic, she was uh, at at her house uh, outside the city here and she was playing games with her, her daughter and she had issues with, uh, you know, sort of closed chain arms. And we were talking about balance. So she, remember the game Twister where you're on the, you know, the, yeah. remember mm-hmm. that Susan with the different colors? Mm-hmm. For, I mean, we're yep. dating ourselves here, but you go on the floor and you're twisting. They, with, you're putting, they still make the game, right? Food they red. still make the game? Yes, oh, yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Yeah, that's and purple. Yeah, so she did that with her daughter and it was, and it was fun and she got so much better because her, just with the hands, I'm just moving my arms here. And, and I, and you can easily do something like that in the clinic pretty easily. Right. Yeah. hundred um, percent. Yeah. And, and even with, you know, we're just, just sort of, you know, we're the older population, you know, that may be hard for them to go down, but you can easily, you know, put, put different color th- balls on a, on a table and have them do the same thing. And with, with athletes, you know, you're going to, you know, you're going to want to do, depending on what, what sport they're in, you're going to want to just get them out of their dominant movement pattern, because Mm -hmm. that's okay that they do their dominant pattern because it's their sport, but in life they need choices for movement. And so you need to be able to get them on like my left-sided rower. He's like, Erica, I don't need to be on the right side of the boat. I'm like, I know, (laughs) but you need to be able to get there just in case you, because every, every single movement pattern I assess with this guy, left, 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 everything left. So when you're sitting in a chair, you don't need to be on the left side. That's what has, that's what your issue is. And so to sort of circle back to what Susan said at the beginning with the balance, you, if you train your vision and the rest of your system in, 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 on the, to be more left-sided, that becomes your center over time. Right. And we, right. And so to Susan's point, we normalize it. We were centered, but we're really not until someone whacks us and we fall. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's why pictures are worth a thousand words because you take a picture of somebody in front and behind Mm. and you'll be able to see where their, where their patterns are. It's always interesting to me when, you know, that shows up, it's like, Oh, I need to work on that a little bit. Um, (laughs) I'm still leaning to the left a little bit. Why am I doing that? Yeah. Uh, The, you know, so to throw everybody else the for, because I started off talking about pelvic health and then we switched and now I'm going to go back to it because I wanted to set the stage. So if you have somebody, one of the things we know from the literature, so let's, throw some evidence at this too and tie it together is we know that hip angles and hip capacity changes with people with stress and urge incontinence. We know that now we've got some good evidence that that has been forthcoming. We know we need to build hip capacity, but we also need to look at how people are moving. This is where the one-legged stance thing comes in because with people with these issues, if you look at this, you're going to see one side or both sides that they cannot control hip rotation when they stand on one leg, generally it's going to go to internal rotation Mm. Um, on one side. They're going to shift and they're going to internally rotate. Now put them and start watching them walk. And what you'll see is internal rotation happening too soon. We need to internally rotate with hip hyperextension for the close packing of the, of the femoral head into the acetabulum with, with regular walking. That's normal. That's what we need, but we lose that. When we have, when people, so what came first, the chicken or the egg? I don't know. And at this point, it doesn't really matter. When they've got the symptom of incontinence, whether it's urge or or stress, 
and they've got these musculoskeletal changes, we know we've got to build hip capacity, but we also need to work on timing and movement of this stuff. Now, why does this affect the balance system? Because if you think about people who are leaking, think about the motor pattern and control that they try to employ to stop it, right? It's not just mm. about the pelvic floor. You know, they're trying to maybe over-recruit or under-recruit their pelvic floor, but they're also over-recruiting their adductors oh, yeah. and perhaps their internal rotators to like pull things together. Yeah. It's normal. That's a normal uh, response to an abnormal situation. The brain doesn't know what to do. And so it's like, do, do this. <laughs> you know, yeah. yeah. I got no nothing otherwise. <laughs> and, <laughs> um, and so think about if somebody is doing that for, you know, I don't know, a few years or maybe 30 years, how that would, you know, maybe lead to hip dysplasia or labral fraying, mm, you know, yeah. or, you know, maybe even set people up for, you know, total hip replacements, you know, like, and and think yeah, of what the balance is done around this. So if this is the way we're walking mm. and we're not even getting good hip extension because we're getting this internal rotation too early and it's affecting the way we walk, it's affecting the way we run. And a lot of times people will have these symptoms when they try to do those things. There are, you know, having it with sneezing, coughing, laughing, you know, er occasionally jumping or or yelling. But now it's going on when they when they're walking, and now it's going on when they're trying to run, mm -hmm. um, or exercise, or some other things. And yeah. um, the balance system has pulled itself around this yeah. because that we're going to be doing this all the time because we're afraid to leak, and we've developed this posture, and we've lost capacity in our hips, and we've got this early timing of hip angles that are that are not really the best for walking i'm not saying they're terrible but they're not the best um our balance system is adapted to that yeah so we may be able to teach people how to lift their pelvic floor and to have good pelvic floor strength um you know uh but there's still like most people still aren't doing that well six months out and even the ones who do real good pelvic floor muscle training do better. No question about it. It does help, but it doesn't, it doesn't get them all the way. And part of the reason is a, we're not addressing the hips and B we're not addressing the balance system. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, you know, because what have they lost if they're doing this type of movement pattern all the time, mm -hmm. they've lost all of their rotational transverse plane motion mm -hmm. or a good deal of it. Yeah. They've probably got a coronal plane motion that's dominant to one side mm -hmm. and their sagittal plane motion is the, you know, leads the way, yeah. you know, so they're doing this sagittal plane motion with this dominant coronal plane shift and they don't have any rotation in the system, you know, yeah. like transverse, like for good, for good stuff. So their balance system yeah. starts to pay a price Yeah, yeah. and the balance system isn't going to change until we get it to change. You know, the input of just doing pelvic floor muscle training, I would dare say is not enough no, to change okay. the balance system. No. I think hip no. exercises of their own are good. They're not enough. No. It takes the whole system and working the whole system from the top to the bottom and the bottom to the top to change. And if, and if bouncing makes it worse, then we have to eventually get them to have all of this and be able to bounce on top of it. <laughs> yeah. And can they recruit their pelvic floor standing on one leg? Can they yeah. recruit their pelvic floor, you know, appropriately? In, but, yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. Wh whatever the demands of the task are. But, you know, uh, can they jump? Can they do a box jump? Right. And not leak? Okay. Well, mm -hmm. that's that absolutely needs to get trained, right? Yeah. You just, don't do supine pelvic floor exercises. So um, mm -hmm. that's that that sort of ties it in. And uh, I remember reading the article. Are you talking about the hip? There was one the article I think we mentioned on one of the podcasts. Let's see if I can find it um, on hip internal rotation angles. Was that recent, Susan, or was that one um, a couple of years ago? A few years ago, not a couple very, years ago. Very yeah, long ago. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think yeah. we may have had. That. I'll yeah, see if I can find it on the podcast. We've talked about yeah. it before and we've, we talked have, about yeah. hip, we've talked about hip strength we've talked about squat and yeah. uh, you know the squat angles yeah that's right so, um where you really need to go deeper than 90 you know but yes you yes help, you may have to do assistant squats to help people do that 
you know, and I'll, and I'll bring in one last thing because I know that we've had, you know, we have people who do a lot of interesting different things and nobody works with their balance system other than in the upright position. And I really think there's, we need to get people like rolling to get out of bed and rolling on and off the floor. And, um, you know, I don't know, do, do people Falling. work with need to have their head upside down? Yeah, if they yeah. do. Maybe you need to train the balance system in an inverted position. Mm -hmm. I love inversions. Yeah, yeah. So, like, what is it that they do? What is it that they need to do? And then show me. Always, my biggest thing is show me. Show me how you do it. Show me what you mean. Show me, and then tell me what's going on with you, and let's figure out what we can do around this to make it better for you. Yeah, and I'll just finish off with my thing real quick. Mm -hmm. I have a patient of mine. He's very stiff, older gentleman, longtime patient. It's like, I feel a little wobbly when I walk. I'm like, okay, well, well when is that happening? When I bend over to, mm -hmm. put the, to put my leash on the dog, I'm like, okay, well, that's not your balance. <laughs> I mean, that is, but that's definitely a movement pattern mm -hmm. that that's the head drop, right? Yeah. And he's older. Mm -hmm. So uh, to your point, I, I like that. I like hands and knees. I like getting a lot of the older people, um, it, you know, even if it's just, crawling right i mean they want to get on their knees with, you know they want to get on the floor uh you know with their grandchildren or 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 just pick up after their dogs on the streets here in new york city right mm -hmm. or at the dog park or wherever or at the dog park exactly mm -hmm. exactly and so uh i mean we could go on and on about this subject but uh the squat at the squat um episode that susan mentioned i think that was a while ago so if you just go on the website um, our tough to treat.com website and type in like squats. There's going to be a ton of episodes, but you'll know there was one that we did. We talked about it, Susan. There was an article right. during the pandemic where yeah, it hip means angles. butt mm -hmm. to floor squat yeah. and hip angles. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yep. So I just wanted to put that out there. Everybody remember the balance system is hugely important and should be tied into whatever you're doing with your clients. Get that system as nimble as possible. So they can have a much more um, variety and variability around their movement choices and movement patterns. Um, a, a stubborn balance system will not allow that to happen. It, okay. It'll just keep going back to where it was before. So that's when you know that that driver is what's keeping them there. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And you can see them change under certain things, but when they just walk back in the door and you have them stand there and it looks just like it did three weeks ago, you know that you've got to really get in there and start, you know, uh, really start working on the reactionary stuff and the changing and getting more rotation in so that they can actually begin to uh, free that system up to be much more nimble. All yeah. right. We look forward to your comments as always. And don't forget to leave, a, leave us a review. We're, looking this is episode number 200 and so in 2024 we're looking for getting up to 200 reviews reviews we're at 115 at csm there were a lot of people at our at our talk it was great didn't know we had a podcast so spread nice. the word all of you new persons who found us we're so excited that you're here for everybody else thank you for being loyal listeners uh, let us know what you think. Let us know your thoughts. Leave us a review and we will see you soon. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you.